Hello everybody, good evening. Welcome to this conversation, this virtual blackouts conversation. Uh, my name is Mwenya and I have the pleasure of holding space for this conversation tonight. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, um, Virtual Blackout Experiments in the Future of Form is a project that has brought together digital artists and sonographers and theater makers of various kinds um, together in collaboration over a very short space of time to make a work for the National Arts Festival. And those works are live and ready to be seen. And this conversation um, is really an opportunity to check in, find out how everyone is doing um, at this point in a collaborative process to really acknowledge the whole process as um, experimental um, and uh, to take a moment of pause really and find out what has worked well, what has been challenging um, in light of the nature of the collaborations between disciplines and in light of different uh, working practices coming together. And also in light of this particular very turbulent moment we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, lastly, just uh, in terms of my beginning um, remarks is to acknowledge the fact that the South African creative space has lost some um, precious people in the last few weeks and um, just to acknowledge anyone who will be part of the conversation tonight who is feeling the proximity of loss in this time. Um, and how this will go is we have five representatives from each of the uh, groups, each of the collaborative working groups, who will introduce themselves. They'll speak a little bit about their project. Um, and then I'm going to ask them each to give us three words uh, that describe the process of this work for them. Um, and then we will take it from there. Uh, for the uh, audience, imagine that there's a, a virtual empty chair on this virtual stage that we are in, in this virtual room um, that can be occupied by any of you at any point to contribute to the conversation, to add your input, to ask your questions. Um, also, please feel free to use the chat function, uh, the hand raise function, and yeah, the idea is that we really are in conversation with each other about, about these works. And I think that's it. I am going to turn over to the panel and ask um, Hannah to start us off with an introduction and just a little bit about your project. Evening, everybody. Um, my name is Hannah Lax. I'm a sonographer, I'm a director, and I'm an illustrator. Um, I have a master's in directing from Rhodes. And I have a master's in scenic and costume design from Tulane in New Orleans. Um, and I'm also a lecturer in performance studies and drama at the University of UKZN. Um, and I am the fifth member of the collaborating team um, on Neighbours. Uh, the other artists that collaborated on the project are the amazing Zofa Wallace, Liesl the Cock, Nikki Pilkington, and Mongiwe Kaya. Um, I'll speak very briefly. Neighbours uh, was a really playful exploration. Um, it's a whimsical story about connection. Um, and it's also, I think, in terms of form, an investigation in how we might translate the richness of theater, um, kind of using the talents that we had, which were physical comedy and 2D animation. Um, and I think the story arose out of the intensity of the confinement that we felt uh, during the, pa the pandemic individually. Um, and it emerged in a kind of imagined experience of two people who might live next door to each other and how they might affect each other. Um, and I guess it's a kind of playful story into a change of heart and a change of form. Super, thanks Hannah. Craig, would you like to go? Hello everyone, um, I'm Craig Leo. Um, and uh, our production, or our little um, piece is called The Lonely Sailor. Our team is uh, by Letsi Tsatsi. Uh, and we've also got um, Megan Judge, who is our um, 
digital artist. By Let's see, he's a writer, storyteller. And then we had Roberto Pombo, who's a physical theater performer, clown, um, actor. And then Rob Murray, as I think most of you might know, who is um, also a director. Um, and um, together we also created a piece also using the work that these, these wonderful people make. Um, Megan was the first person that I uh, was introduced to um, on this on this uh, platform um, and I was immediately drawn to her work. She's a digital artist um, and her work is very uh, um, abstract in a way. Um, what I felt really um, special is that what her work does which doesn't often happen to me is that I immediately felt like the stage was set um, and as a scenic designer <clears throat> I didn't feel like I needed to design anything but I wanted to inhabit the world and find ways to inhabit that world um, so just to because Megan's not here today and um, she's got a little girl or a little boy that she needs to put to bed um, I really wanted her to be able to talk about her work so I'm going to read something that is a combination of my experience of the work, but also um, some of her words so that you, you hear, I mean, because what she's done is this is, her, this is her PhD research. So it's, you know, it's very in depth. Um, um, so I'm just gonna read a little bit about it. Um, Megan's research investigates the edge of where human and ocean blur within the Southern Ocean's context. It is based on her own experience of sailing on the high ocean losing contact with the world and being left alone with the natural world. She began making friends with the stars and singing to fish, um, becoming undone only to discover new layers that were just waiting to be discovered. For our piece, the investigation was what happens to the body and the wetting of the psyche when surrounded completely by the ocean and all you have are crackling broadcasts that dwindle and fade the longer and further you drift away from land how the skin becomes porous and the definitive line between you and your environment begins to blur. Surely this unbecoming and becoming undone gives way to a new state of being. Megan used words like thickening of time um, and a discovery of the wet space, which I um, found very, very um, intriguing. In the same way as I wanted to inhabit her work, I now wanted to experience and discover what this could mean for me and the work we would embark on. Structurally, we decided to use marine weather broadcasting as a form uh, that the text could take. And the broadcasts of weather um, forecasts, out, marine weather forecasts specifically as a structure, um, uh, the repetition of sounds, words, and image forever looping serves to thicken that time, allowing the view, viewer to groove deeper into the experience. So that's a little bit about um, our project. Um, it has been an extraordinary um, two weeks, and um, I've loved every second of it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Tandal, would you like to go? Hi everyone, my name is Noluta de Lovese. I'm a stage and costume designer, also an artist. So on this project, I collaborated with four other artists. So one of them is Vanessa Lorenzo, she's a digital artist. And Linduwe Machigi is a theater maker. She's a writer, director, performance, she's just everything. Um, and then there's Teresa Putimujela, a choreographer. And then we have Nikki Pilkington, a filmmaker and sound. Um, so our approach for this with Vanessa, it's, um, it's an early stage. Our work is kind of like similar. Um, so we work with, um, we're interested in the connections, um, just a minute. So interested in the connections, the technology, the nature and the rituals. And from that, we had to come up with a, with, a, with a common ground as to how we can work together. And usually because we're interested in the nature and because of lockdown, I mean, you're not in touch with nature anymore. So then it also became about um, emotions, you know, the emotions that went through, I think with everyone, everyone can relate to that. Um, 
So with, um, with, with these emotions, um, it's about uh, people entering an unknown space, you know, which is the cave um, and it's more like a vacuum. So this unknown space, you're not sure whether you will come back or you're moving forward or you will ever make it or you will ever see a light again. And um, that, so, so then that is more like a journey of emotions. And that reminded us of the mine workers that leave their families uh, behind to excavate riches for us. You know, they're entering this dark cell, this dark hole, um, and they never get to see the light. So I think with uh, my, many, my many mouths, we wanted to bring the healing and to bring light um, into this dark space. So in a nutshell, that's what our, our work is about, uh, entering this dark space. Um, and how can we heal from that? Because we feel like the world needs healing right now, you know, and uh, finding moments where we can breathe. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Super, thank you. Thanks, Tando. Um, Natalie, would you like to go next? Hello, everybody. I'm Natalie Paneng, and I am with the group, with another group, and our title for our pieces, and they wanted to contain the collapse. Um, in my group, my collaborators are Gerard Besta, Carla Fonseca, Vaughn Sadie, and Katia Chale. And um, yeah, so our piece, I think for us, started off with just a conversation and trying to get to know each other and all kind of realized that at the point of our interaction, the world was going through so much and it was so hard to kind of just progress and make a piece. And we just started speaking about all the things that were happening in the world and how those things were affecting us. And from there, we've kind of made a piece that speaks back to the kinds of things that have happened due to the pandemic and during the pandemic and the triggers that have come up. And yeah, so it's basically everybody's perspective, feelings and view um, tried. We try to kind of put it all in a ball and present it to the world. Cool. Great, thank you. Awesome. And um, Francesco? Oh, hi, I'm Frankie. Um, I'm a theatre maker and a writer and um, designer and educator. And I've been working with an amazing group of people, Tsefo Kutswane, Kombo uh, Chapfika, uh, Jane Batsevin and Billy Langer who, um, and we've created this kind of, I would say it's like a collective unconscious wish uh, for a future which we have imagined because of the confine in a way. So a change of the way that we experience our experiencing of an imagined future, which sounds very abstract. It is an abstract work. And we, we managed to work successfully in generating material by working off writing prompts. So we would ask each other questions and then people would write first person stuff. So we stitched it together from all these, um, all these satellites um, and came together with like a, a form of like visual uh, poetry, I guess. Yeah. That's it, I think. Great, thank you. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, if I can ask for a quick fire round in the order that um, you have just presented. So Hannah, then Craig, then Tando, Natalie, and then Frankie, for three words that would describe your process. Like the first three that come to the top of your head and then the next person go, next person, next person. Hannah, go for it. Um, wonderful. The three words I have are playful, messy, and amphibious. <laughs> playful, messy, and? Amphibious. Fabulous. Great. <laughs> New, um, release, and rewarding. Awesome. Tando. Unmute. Yeah, well, sorry, I missed that. What was the question again? 
<laughs> three words, your, the three words that come to, the, to your mind right now for how you would describe uh, the process of, of making this work. Oh, um, distortion, unknown mouth. <laughs> Fabulous, Natalie. My words are green. Um, I just had them. Reporting and blending. Frankie. Um, I've got the word labyrinthine. Um, turbulence and lucid dreaming. That's two words. Friends. Brilliant. Thank you. We might take some of these up as we go and ask for some expansion. Um, I'm wondering if there are any, um, any elaborations any of you would like to make on your introductions or if there are any comments or contributions already from other members of any of the groups or general audience. Was that a hand? How am I going to know? Um, Ashley, I saw a, a wave of an arm. Was that a hand? Ashley Dowds, did you have a contribution to the conversation you wanted to make? No, I think I was just falling off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm just, I'm just in thought at the um, at the variety of topics here and the and and the entry points that everyone's taken. So I, I'm just really looking forward to hearing more about each one. Um, and maybe that's something we can take up um, uh, as uh, the, the idea of your entry points. Um, and unless you have already in your introduction, if that's something that you can speak to, that kind of, because the time really was so short. And as Tegan was saying earlier, before we patched into everyone else, the work is extraordinary. And the, you know, the, the different disciplines coming together is one thing, but people's personal contexts is a whole other thing. And so there had to be a starting point and obviously they would have really varied for each group. So um, if that's something any of you panelists or anyone else from the groups wants to take up, now's your chance. Starting points. I can start with that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, like I think any, any quick turnaround is, is really a, a complex process because it starts off relatively messy. And I think we started in the mess uh, and we started in the kind of juiciness of sharing what we could bring to the table, which felt like it would be really uh, important in navigating the bridge that we need to cross to get to some form of delivery. Um, so we kind of spent a week of, of saying yes and and playing and like experimenting with form and seeing where the richness maybe lay and if there was any root that we could we could find and then I think it was like a really interesting um, moment where I think the the deadline started looming and that like joyous playing had to like <laughs> kind of condense and distill itself into a form um, and that was like a really interesting tension to feel that shift um, and that navigation towards something that was a little bit more product driven, whereas our entry point felt a lot more playful um, and kind of embracing of the mess. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Anyone else want to respond to the question of starting points? I'll go, as you, I guess. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, who's going? Me? Go no, and then talk. Cool. Okay, cool. So I think um, what Hannah said is really interesting and true because it was just like two weeks and you had to kind of choose where you're going to like, where you invest um, or where you start off. And for us, uh, we had to cut, so we started off, I think, with the starting point of how will it be like inputted or like how will it be in the final product and what is the fastest way to get there and everyone how's the fastest way to get everybody there and so we kind of took what I'm able to do as a digital artist right now or like the current interests and put everybody almost into a format and that started 
And I think for us, we mainly use green screen. So in a week, basically, everybody had to learn Natalie, for some reason, Natalie, Natalie, we've lost you. Natalie, can you hear me? For some reason, we can't hear you, even though it didn't look like you were on mute. You were just talking about green screen and then the sound disappeared. And now maybe you have disappeared altogether. Oh, the joys, the joys, the joys of Zoom. Okay, so we'll find her and bring her back and keep talking about um, how she taught her whole group green screen, how to use green screen. Um, and meanwhile, let's move on to Tando and we'll, we'll loop Natalie back in when she can rejoin us. Hey guys. Oh, it's just... <laughs> okay, hey. she's back. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. Right. Back, but it's fine. You can go. I'm done. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, it's just one thing um, that was really interesting for us, you know, as theater makers, that you um, usually create work for an audience to come to come view it. You know, you have like three weeks or uh, a whole month, you know. Um, whereas uh, with, uh, with, with this work, with this collaboration, and these connections that, that we've created uh, or that you guys created for us rather, you know, the facilitators, um, we found that there are, no, there are no borders in the digital world, you know, um, and there's so much that we can achieve. So this is really amazing that we can create work in our different spaces and we come up with something that's tangible, you know? Um, so I, I, think, I think it was a, a beautiful, beautiful process, but also, a bit challenging because we had to use a 360 camera, with me, uh, myself and Lindy, that we've never used before, you know? Um, so just trying to figure things out and trying to make, uh, to find ways to, to turn them into, um, into a beautiful product, you know? So it's just some of those challenges that we got, but it was beautiful. I think uh, overall, we enjoyed the process. Great, thank you. It, it did seem like there were some steep learning curves all around. Um, anyone else want to respond to this, this question of starting points? Yes, Monia. Um, um, just from our starting point, what I found so interesting and a little bit terrifying actually, is that as a theater maker, usually you start from the inside um, and you work with a core idea or, um, uh, you know, I've often worked in productions where there's a lot of workshopping and, and unpacking of, um, uh, possibility and to be uh, presented with something um, so formed already is really uh, that's why I find it quite liberating because you you know I was given this work um, and we started rather than starting with um, the theatre makers you started with the digital artists and the designers and that doesn't happen um, not very often um, so to start with those that sort of, um, uh, um, those, those theater makers, the people who design and, and do digital work, and then to work backwards from there and get to the core, get to the meaning, is a completely uh, reverse way of working for, for me, for most of the time. So we started with the outside and then we kind of worked towards a central point where, they, where we discovered something that had resonance and had meaning, um, which is really interesting. And I've been lucky enough to work with uh, in situations where, for example, we've had to listen to the music and then spend two days drawing before we started to go onto the floor and rehearse, or perhaps ended up uh, with just a structure, knowing what the structure will be, but you don't know what the content is going to be. And that felt a little bit like this, working with the digital artists who are prim the primary kind of source of inspiration, their work uh, presented to us, and then we were able to choose or, or, or decide uh, meet up with certain members of those, uh, so meeting up with or, or kind of finding a something that you resonate with and then working backwards from there was really interesting. Um, 
and not a process that I have experienced very often. So that was liberating. Great, thanks Craig. And um, thank you also for uh, putting on the table that a major starting point that was a, um, a, a unique feature of this whole project was that it was very purposefully design led. So the sonographers and the digital artists um, made teams first and did some initial conceptualizing before the theater makers were brought in. So that is a, yeah, that is a, um, a feature of how this, this process has worked. Um, there is a there was a question put on the chat about let me see if I can find it um, I think it's from Katlejo um, something about a gazelle sorry let me just scroll back here and find it um, Katlejo describes the experience as feeling like an infant gazelle learning to run as they walk is the quote and the question is how do you believe this experience has enriched your body of work. And it sounds like that's a question that can go to any of the um, any of the participants from any of the groups. Anyone like to take that on? How you believe this experience has enriched your body of work? Um, I, I feel like it's a, it's an endless journey, you know. Um, it, it, it will keep growing. There's, there's no end to it. It's, 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 it's fluid. It, it, that's the, you know, and that's the approach. And um, I think going back to what Craig has, um, has said, that the, the design led the, the process. So with, uh, with designing the world, and then the script is developed from, from that, it can just go on, you know. So people coming in with their own views from 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 diverse, you know, from diverse backgrounds. So um, it can be it's endless. So I don't think you will ever reach um, your desire, like the theater. You know, you, you know that you have an audience, and it will open, and then that's it. It ends there, you know. And then you wait for the next one to come. But this one, it's an ongoing thing. So. Thanks, Tando. Hannah, go for it. Yeah, I think I'd like to just agree with, with Tando and Craig. And just like as a designer, it's so exciting to work in this capacity and in this form. And it, I felt like it provided a lovely blueprint for how we could potentially devise differently. Um, because I think often like designers feel like the hands that hold spaces or worlds or the facilitators to ideas and it's it's so nice to start uh, with a route that's an image um, and kind of navigate a form and a process that's centered also on what uh, you can offer which is it's just felt really exciting yeah awesome um frankie i saw in the chat that you have a point go for it unmute yourself though Oh yes, sorry. Uh, just when you were talking when you're now about entry points, I found it so interesting how we had to locate the entry points to the person who we don't know, <laughs> which is an amazing, it, it's an amazing transformative in some way. I mean, with all that means, which is con uh, with all the mess. Uh, to, to check in with people who you don't know where they are and you don't know how they are beyond what they're saying to you. So I guess working virtually, what we lost is the, the communication between the bodies to bodies and what we read of each other and how we read each other online and how you moderate so much what you say online. Whereas if you were in a room full of people and you were like, just talk to me, there's so much to be experienced of a person-to-person -person contact, which we all use so much in our live performance practice, which has to be replicated or kind of like hybridized or like Frankensteined into being, which was to me, the whole thing has been mega experimental. Um, we're not done, like we are all like in a, but it's, it's, my students go through it all the time. They're always like, oh, so um, it was so difficult to collaborate with people I don't know. And I always say, just get over it. Like, that's drama. And then I come to me doing it. And I'm like, how did, 
How did they do it? How did they do it? They were so good at it. How did they do it? Because, wow, wow. It's good practice. I'll have to, I'll say that. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Frankie. Mongi, join us. Hello, everybody. So good to see everyone who started this project again all together and this experience of doing this. What a crazy time. Um, the point I wanted to make was, you know, at the beginning, um, I was nervous because obviously from a theater maker perspective, we are physical beings. We, you know, we work with the body. And so, you know, early on, I committed myself to going, whatever this tech experience is going to be, it's going to be. Um, and what I've found is it, it was Frankenstein, but I've also found that that is what theater is because you kind of, you come with your ideas and you're trying to, ah, I need that. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to match uh, these, uh, these differences. And we, we came down to two things that I found always helpful. One is I, I love democracy, but I love a vision more. And <laughs> it's really great to commit as a team to go, you individual, we want you, to, you seem to have the best ability to coalesce us all. It's tough, but you have to bring us all together. And so it gave me relief because then my job was to give. Um, and that's what I'm used to which is you come into the room and you get asked and you give. And I really enjoyed the team. Once we com committed to the whimsy and to the vision, um, I'm quite proud. It was just a lot of work and it was a beautiful thing. Um, I think this form has a lot of growth available to us. Um, and I know that for all of us, it's still tough because we are physical, but I, I'm, I, think, I think it was an important experience. I think there was a, a growth of, of learning how to share in the new world. You know, theater has been around through all the changes and this is the newest one. So we're just part of that journey. And I'm thankful to have been here. Thanks, Mongi. I love this um, phrase of yours of matching differences as opposed to overcoming them or doing anything else with them. There's something about matching differences that feels really on point. Um, Lindy, we join us. Hi. I'm also eating imaginary food with my daughter. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to, to say that I think something that was really clear to me throughout this process is um, is maybe oh. working towards an idea that it's worth investing in these processes for process sake you know uh, I think our group in particular has struggled and is still struggling with the idea of creating an end product where what's really been generative and really useful and really powerful has been the exchange and the flow and the intuitive and the following and the, and the evolution of, of ideas as we go. And yes, so I think in, in the future, I would love to see more uh, people, bodies, institutions, festivals, investing purely in process work. Uh, and I think it can go further and, and allow for people to work at a pace that is um, really used, useful, yeah, so that's my two cents. Hi, Osha, thank you, thanks, Lindy. Um, I, I, I wonder if anyone wants to take on the process, you know, what maybe from the outside, outside seems like a tension between um, kind of pro process-oriented folk and maybe product oriented folk. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, it's a false distinction in many ways, obviously, but I do wonder if um, 
you know, if it's a, if it's a tension that, that was felt strongly, continues to be felt strongly or not, um, or if it existed at all. Um, because I think Lindy's point is, is well taken. A, the time was extremely short, but there is also, you know, often a real lack of space for theater makers at least to, um, to practice and to engage in process for process's sake. And the push to produce is often a pressure that is um, unnecessarily felt, but because the industry works the way it is, you know, we find ourselves in like product mode often. Um, so I wonder if anybody wants to take that on or respond to that. Hannah, I see you, go ahead. Hey, um, I, I think that's such a fascinating point because the tension between like process and product felt so intense uh, in this in this process. Um, and I think like what I was struck by was that at the end of the process, although we delivered a product, the things that rang the most loudly for me were the questions that f the follow up questions for what happens now, like how you know, I think all of the works, all the work that we created could have gone in so many different ways. And it felt like the process had to be on some other level, like distilled towards a form, but had it been allowed to like go and run and like run hard, I feel like there's really exciting richness in those points. Um, so I think, yeah, at this, at this end point now of discussing this, I'm so struck that there's so much potential present in process driven exercises. And that's where I feel like the next step is, um, if anyone were to take this, this forward is like, how do we, what, what next? And, and the questions are, are the most illuminating and exciting for me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I can see a bunch of related questions in the chat, starting with Ashley's um, that says, if you had a year to develop the project, how different would it look? And then Lindy's question of what is done? Anyone want to jump in there? If you had a year to develop this project, how would it look? Any thoughts on that? I do. Um... On the whole thing of it being a year. So I think when we realize that it's like a week or two weeks, we're just like, there's no way we have like time to do something completely linear from all our contexts, from all like the spaces we're in, our different times, you know, like there's no way it's going to be linear because we are not in a linear space ourselves to even create um, something linear together. So I think for Let's give her two seconds because she did return to us last time. Okay, when she rejoins, we'll loop her back in. Natalie? No, not yet. Okay. Um, anyone else want to jump in while we wait for Natalie to reconnect? Craig, go ahead. I think, you know, I think it's a very difficult question to answer, like, what would it look like in a year? Um, the, I think the honest answer, certainly from my perspective, would be how could I possibly know that? What I do know, um, as opposed to what I don't know, what I do know is that it would be, we've already, as a group, have become incredibly excited about taking it further. Um, how, what form or shape that might take, we don't know. Um, and I'm a little bit nervous because I, I think that the two weeks or whatever it was that we had was part of a liberation in a way. That was the thing that that made it um, what it is. Um, so you change that, you change everything. Um, and in terms of the the, look, the working in the group, um, being far away from each other, um, not in the same cities, um, it felt very much, particularly with our project, um, like you were looking at a, standing together in a gallery looking at a painting. And you all have different thoughts and feelings about that thing that you're looking at, that image. Um, and this process was just about letting everyone in. Um, what was difficult is how, how you find, so for example, we have a group of people in our team who are extraordinary at what they do. Um, 
but they're also incredibly flexible. So they were able to go, well, you know, for, for example, Roberto, who, who's an, one of my favorite human beings to watch on stage, there wasn't necessarily space for him to do what he does, but he came in with a whole bunch of other things that he could do, like play the piano and do voiceovers and doing sound clips. And, and uh, you know, so there was this incredible uh, generosity and the, and that made it, it made the whole process rich and fertile and not difficult actually. Um, I never at any point did, I certainly never felt like, oh God, oh God, we've got to produce anything. I could feel immediately that what was happening was a natural uh, progression uh, because of the way that, and the kinds of people we worked with, the generosity and the openness and the, uh, also, also this thing that, <laughs> that the only person in the room that really knew what she was doing digitally was Megan. The rest of us were like, oh, we've never done anything like this. I don't even know how I can barely do my email. You know, I can log on to Facebook and that's about it. So we relied on her uh, for a large, a lot of the weight. And that's why I'm terribly sorry she's not here because she, she carried the burden in a, in a sense. Um, so she would be able to comment more. She would probably go, no, it was hell. I'm saying it was a wonderful experience. But for her to uh, to be able to, uh, for us to give her, uh, feed her with information and then to receive it back from her on a daily basis was the most exciting thing because it, 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 it tapped into a world that I know nothing about but is very exciting. Um, and the possibilities are endless. I think I might have said way too much there but i'm just waiting for um <laughs> for, uh, somebody to come back online <laughs> natalie is back mongi i see you <laughs> natalie do you, do you want to finish your um input and then mongi go ahead straight after yeah sorry my internet's really bad mercury's in micro braids anyway um <laughs> So I think for us, it would have just given us a lot of time basically to um, create something more linear, but I don't necessarily think that projects need a year, is what I was going to say. I don't think that collaboration needs such a long span of engagement and like over conceptualization. I think it was amazing to just do something and know that at this point it would be over and we would give our best um during that timeline and whatever would come from it would be a surprise to all of us and i think that's kind of how we all felt we all had the same kinds of words and we were speaking in the same language we got to a point where we needed to do that almost to keep creating but we never knew how it would end up looking and i think just that that faith that like we're using the same words we're engaging in the same things and we know it's only going to be a week um was really nice because it actually gave a lot of clarity and just learned that this is the best we can do and we're all trying to kind of contribute in the best way so yeah i don't think things need a year that's what i'm saying but i mean it would have been different definitely yeah i think that uh i totally agree with that because you know uh well the thing that we came from or i felt that the moment that we had the aha for our project was in the recognition, recognition of transitions, that it was where are the points of link in terms of the creation. So we were nervous of committing to video because we were a bit confused, like we don't want to make a film. <laughs> we were like, we wanted to make a theater production and that that was going to be a challenge of doing that but at the same time, once we realized that that was our problem, that we were locked into the problem, we couldn't create. We let that go. We accepted that these are the limitations of the form and started to play with those. And the freedom that we had is in the way things go from one thing to another, from animation to real life performance, from one performer to the other. And a great example of that is the red wall of the whole artwork. Um, just one day, just discovering that Liesl had a red wall, I had a red wall. It opened us up to go, oh, we can connect through space. That's all we want to do. Like, we're not worried about like, 
being overly clever. We just want to connect. And we focused on areas of connection and trusted that they would generate enough meaning and allowed ourselves the most basic and simplest of storytelling. Um, you know, we understood what we were looking for, which was to try and find a way to talk about art as a release because we were needing this experience and the work, or at least I was needing it, I think other people, to be released from the isolation and the struggles. And so in searching for connection or transition, which is the digital or the editing uh, language for that, there was a lot of um, discoveries we made. And just to say, because for me, uh, and I think for Liesl as well, being performers in the devising arena, you know you're fine when you can just produce lots and lots of stuff that nobody wants. <laughs> because then you feel like I'm doing my job. I know one thing out of the 10 I just made is gonna be acceptable. But then you feel okay because you're giving and you're listening and, and it's going back and forth. So when we talk about a year, I think that like, it sounds a little scary because it allows the openness of not making a choice. And it comes back to the thing we said at the very beginning, which was we decided to focus on a vision um, to say we are going to agree to figure out this idea and to align towards that idea. Awesome. Thank you. I want to go back to a question in the chat that um, was asked by Nokutula a few points ago. Um, and it says, um, now that you've had to transform or reshape your process of creating art, do you still feel like art needs to exist? I think that's meant to say in the existing conventions. Nokutula, let me know if I have not um, said that correctly. So the question is, now that you've had a now that you have had to transform or reshape your process of creating art, do you still feel like art needs to exist in the existing conventions? Anyone want to jump in on that? Any other group members? Oh, <laughs> oh Liesl, go for it. Uh, Natalie and then Liesl. Okay, cool. I was just gonna say art uh, must always reflect its time. And right now, this is the time where we are all at home and hoping to have popping Wi-Fi and hopefully, hopefully able to create and share that work because just because we're inside doesn't mean we don't, we're not artists anymore and that we don't need to keep creating, um, especially if you've built your whole life around it. So I think the conventions don't exist anymore when the world and stages don't exist right now. So it's really important, I think, to constantly move with the flow and adapt and keep adapting. Um, and that is all I have to say. Fabulous, thank you. Liesl? I see Frankie's also got his hand up. Do you wanna go, Great. Frank? Liesl, you go first or we'll go. Okay. Um, so I, it was sort of going on what Mongi was saying, but I, I guess the 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 thing of art being real or what it what it is now, and I suppose as Frankie, yeah, I'm also teaching at the moment and sort of watching students go through this um, and trying to figure out what what their place is in the creative industry and they're studying this thing and sort of trying to be there, guiding them, not knowing what the hell I'm doing at the same time, and then. Um, pop art and you guys offering us this provocation and this platform to answer unanswerable questions and play with the impossible is sort of for me as a t as an educator also going back with like all right so the life that we knew once it might be over and the shape of it will forever be changed but there's a platform as creatives that we are playing with unanswerable questions and we we're creating little answers to it and these are the provocations that we are producing in two weeks with this sort of entry point of two of the designer entry and the next provocation might be a little bit longer with a different entry point but i'm just so grateful that this platform has existed for us to try and tease out what a future might look like because as mongi has say, said it has been so cathartic also just to 
have a sand pit to play in uh, just for the sake of playing. Um, and I know that's a bit uh, self-indulgent and whatever, but it's been such a um, such a wonderful release. And I think the these answers here that I can take back to my students also and guide them, uh, yeah, going forward. So yeah, just wanted to add that. Fabulous, thank you. I just want to alert us to the fact that we have less than 10 minutes and a whole bunch more questions. So Frankie, go for it, and then Lindy, and we'll see who's up next. Okay. Um, I just wanted to talk about how, as a theatre maker, I initially reacted to the performative act existing in any way in a virtual space. I was so against it. I was like, no, it robs it of the sublime, oh, blah, blah. I was like being so boring about it. And um, because I did used to think that what exists between people in space is something that's unrepeatable, it's, there's a mystique, you cannot, uh, you can replicate it, like don't photograph it, like it's holy, blah, blah. And that's fine. But seeing the, uh, seeing how the live moment, because you can also perform on live, we could do a play now, it's a very different perceptual experience for the audience. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that often when I say I make theater, to, some of my theater friends say, but why don't you just put it on the internet? And <laughs> I'm always like, no, but it's not, it's, it's not the internet. It's, it's the world outside of the internet. And they're still like, but why, does, why don't you just put it on the internet? And I guess it made me realize the kind of our blindness to what audiences would think is I don't know how to describe what I mean, but I, I think that people would be more interested in our theater if we did kind of televise it. Um, uh, anyway, it's been interesting to think of how audiences locate theater in their own, like, in, in their own consciousness. Mm. Fabulous, thank you. Lindy. Uh, I can wait if there's more pressing questions. The floor is yours. The floor is yours. Cool. Um, Noctula, that, that question is so great. And I am going to go ahead and take it to mean this time in general and not just this project. Um, I, for me, all the boxes, all the rules are out the window um, completely. And that is influencing everything I'm doing at the moment. It's influencing how I work, how I make work which is mainly for myself at the moment um, and and a process that I'm trying to develop that is mine um, that makes sense to me and so through this particular short experience it feels like more than ever before I have this permission from the universe to be messy and to be um, imperfect and also to not subscribe to what art needs to be, to what it means to make a product. Um, I think we're so conditioned, I said it a bit in the chat, to make a work in three weeks because budget is not there and deadlines are abnormal. And as Nikki, uh, another group member of mine is saying in the chat, um, nothing is normal right now. And so everybody needs to be a bit like, flexible um, and I think that's that's really important and uh, yeah I'm not I'm not here to make products to be honest right now um, yeah <laughs> I've got more to say on that but I'll stop there <laughs> 